Alright everyone, so welcome back to the another part of our RTS journey tutorial sessions. So, let's go ahead and show you what I've been working on for this part. So, here we go. And you say, well, nothing has changed. What have you been working on? So, the project feature side has not changed anything from this part to the last one. I just made a small change in the function for the path, but as you can see, it is almost the same thing. Now, behind the scenes, here is what our unit looks like. So, yes, we no longer have the sprite, and let's look at the code, and oh no, here are the changes. So, this is all the code for our unit. And as you can see, where is the function that moves to the new path? Where is the function that handles the selection and things? And it's gone. All the variables that made the unit before are also gone. And we only have a single one called object data. So in my last part, we have discussed briefly on how to iterate through a unit structure. So a system that allows us to build units just like we see in the sword, the galactic battlegrounds in a way that was more efficient for us as developers to maintain and keep it and this was the final structure and this is basically the work of this structure in action so as you can see here inside of the code we do not have any code that executes the action we only have a slight api here that delegates some functions to other things so behind the scenes here I have four main things that are working here. We have an act manager, which works like actions. We have constants and a data manager and data constants. So for this currently to work, I had to split the script that has all the constants for the script that actually executes the code. So let me just open the constants. So it just holds the constants. So why I have done this? Well, behind the scenes, we needed to be separated from all the other scripts to prevent cycle preloading. So whenever you have a cyclical reference, Godot has some issues. And this is not particular to Godot in programming languages. And when executing code, you cannot call for two simultaneous classes from the same thing. So you cannot make one script to reference another and go back and forth. That creates a cycle dependency. So in order for us to break the cycle dependency, I still want to use a configure file that has all of the constants for everything that I have, everything that I want. So I have made a constants for object actions and one for object data. Following this, <coughs> excuse me, following this idea here of what the object has, what it does and what it is. So what it is, I have not implemented yet. This is going to be a finite state machine that's going to handle the assets behavior. Currently, I have implemented the assets of actions, so what they do and what they have, which is, I think, the two cornerstones of our, our design there. So behind the scenes, the unit itself is just a single mesh with this script code. So it only has this code which are only references. I'm using aliases to shorten the script names, the code itself, and we only have a single variable. So everything happens inside of this variable. So this object data is going to hold what they have. And similar to what we have discussed, like these, they can have a bunch of different properties, such as this incredible long list. So the idea is to process the object based on what they have and currently we have some elements here so i just i think i've used only these ones so the variables you you are usually seeing inside of the unit script as vars are now handling inside of object data and i only have these ones that work so finally what is the code that is handling everything so you're going to see that a reference here on object actions. Now, in order for autocomplete to work, I have made this a constant so it can detect whenever functions doesn't have a specific arguments, it's going to know that. So yeah, that's the idea. So let's open the actual main script. So I have two main scripts, which is the manager for object actions and for object data. So object data, I think it's a little more complex but it's fairly simple. We only have things related to the data stuff. So I'm going to show you how all of this is being used in the code itself. 
For now, this is just an overview for you to see what is going on behind the scenes. So I only have information that is pertinent to the object data itself. Now, of course, this does not have until complete, as you can see here, because we do not know what type of object that is. And that is intended for our design structure here. So we do not know or need to know what kind of object these things are going to be. Because in the code, we are going to define that later. So, but we, we only expect them to have this variable, which is object data. And sadly, because Godot doesn't have interfaces, we need to do this by expecting this to work. So there's no way for us to make Godot check if that object actually has data. Yes, I can do a bunch of boilerplates that says if this object has data, work with it. But I instead have chose not to do it, also to not overcomplicate things. So we we'll only expect for objects to have this object data variable where we're going to store everything we need and actually call the functions appropriately. So we execute the functions and call. The main thing for now is being the action manager, which is going to list other action scripts that actually has the features we want. So I currently have a action package for move and one for selectable. So in essence, I turn this little mesh here to be a selectable object and it also allows it to move. So whenever the player on the RTS scripts interface is calling for these objects to move, where we have here, for instance, move units to mouse, it's going to call for a function inside of those objects, which are expected to be movable units for a new path and it's going to pass the coordinates. And the objects themselves, which are our basic units, have a method to that, which is simple API to just pass this information to the action script of actions move to generate a new path and it's going to pass itself and the where, where it wants to go. So this is how I am actually isolating the script code for the action movement and only allowing our mesh instance to become a unit itself. The code that does the actions are here as follows. So let's take this simple one, which is the selectable. So this is the code that actually allows an object to be selected. So we have a bunch of references. We have one from the manager and I don't even know if I am even using all of those references like this one I'm not using. I can actually remove it because this was part of the script that I was working. So in essence, this script basically allows us to make an object to be selected. In order for that to work, as we have established in our design here, I have chose, I think I have talked about it. So whenever we have some actions like what they do so they can gather resources in order for them to gather resources we're going to allow them to have a property inside of the object that says this is a worker type of object so every action is going to need to be initialized in essence almost like a class variable and um, in order for that to work i have made an a function that is going to be standard for all the actions and it's going to be called initialize action. So our action move has one, which is initialize action and our selectable action also has one. And it's basically it's going to set the groundwork for this action to work. And that is basically how this is working. So we have our unit. Once it's ready, it's going to call for a startup code. The startup code is going to set first some information. Now this is going to be part of object Pre, uh, object presets and data. This is for future. For now, it's just a simple hack. So we are adding for our object a simple variable of move speed. And we do that by accessing our script data constants, which is this script file. And it's going to grab the, one of these variables. In this case, I think it was move speed. So we are adding for that script from its constants. We are grabbing the move speed constant as you see here, and adding 12 as their value. So this function here from the data one is just going to set the data value. So if we have that data value, it's going to check the code. And here is actually a debug operator. So the thing, whenever we are trying to set the value that we don't have, so whenever we, let's just say you have HP and you want to set HP to true or false. So that should throw an error because we want to expect the same type. So this is almost like I'm forcing you to statically type your values. 
this is just a check for the code itself. I go all through the code here once we are building from the last part. This is just an overview. And as you can see here, we finally set the value. So this is just a safe check. So we are basically checking if we already have that data key, if it's from the same type. And we are finally set the value. That's all this function though. So whenever on the code here, let me go back to my unit. We set up the move speed. So it's going to access, access its own object data and set the move speed to 12 which is going to be used by the action of the movable one. Once we try to follow a path, we are going to grab the move speed somewhere here, which is here. So there are a couple of changes on these functions to be statically typed. So this is a static function. It's no longer a dynamic function. And the importance of this is to isolate all the variables to be only from the references of the function itself. The bad thing about this is we don't get out completion and we don't we cannot get the types as well. The only way we can enforce a type is if you do as a specific type. So somewhere here I have initialized a function and I actually here as you can see we are expecting object data as a dictionary. So this is how we can enforce a type from the return of the value. So yeah, that's basically it. So every time we need to access a variable, we need to access the object data itself and to request that variable. So we no longer have access to variables such as these ones where we define. So let me grab here one that's more easy to explain. So let's go back to the ready. See all those variables here. These are no longer defined on the scope of the object. If you remember our design, we want everything to be put inside of what they have. So every single var we need for the actions or anything in the game, we want to be placed inside of what they have, like attributes. So we can say if you have that amount of speed, then we can do this, this and this. So in the code itself, this is how it's working. Instead of you having individual variables or references, everything is being stored inside of object data. The interface that handles all the object data is our data manager script, which is this one. Through this simple API of... And mind you, this is not the full, the full code. We can change this anytime we want. This basically has a simple API to make sure that we are editing the data of the object in a specific way, such as whenever you set a, the data for a, a key inside of that, we want to make sure that we are working with the same type. This is what this code is checking. So that is all the code differences of what they do. Now, why is this important? So feature side, Nothing has changed for the project. We are still able to move units and target trees just as before. However, now, because we have split the actions of the unit to move into a single script and for them to be selectable in another script, it's decoupled from the units itself or the code. And as you can see here, we even no longer need that sprite instance we have exported here on our RTS objects because everything is handled inside of it as a separate code piece. So inside of our action selection, we have here preloaded that 3D sprite scene here, which is, is the sprite we use for the units to be selected. And whenever we initialize the action selectable, I have here made on the initialize action, first to set its variable of object selected to false, next, we add a sprite instance here. So as you can see, that is what it does. We duplicate the, the preloaded scene here and add it back to the color of this action. And we set its global, its global position to be the same of the unit and just to change its heights a little bit so it floats above ground. And we finally set a reference back to this object. So we are accessing the data object so the attributes of what they have is going to have a reference for this object. So the unit itself is going to store a reference back to the script in itself as object data. <clears throat> and this is going to be used whenever we set the object to be selected. So I'm going to call that script. And here we are going to set its visibility. Now, 
this might be complicated for you to understand so we are going to go back to the last part project and updates to use this kind of system and we're going to build it from scratch so all of this was just an overview and mind you that is why i made that presentation so you could understand the concepts we are working in and mind you this is not even implemented the finite state machine for the units asset system which we are going to build on the next parts to make airplanes different from walking units from vehicles so yeah this was one of the ways i could find to work around all the limitations we have if you find another way of working around the issues we have discussed in the last video go ahead and implement them this is not the only way to do this so this is just a way of doing it so let's go ahead and i'm going to switch back now to our last project so for us to do that i'm going to duplicate the last part which I believe it is the RTS part three tutorial. So let me just duplicate this and still it is RTS project, but here I'm going to specify that this is our RTS tutorial now part four, and this will be released under the members for YouTube as well for now. So let's do duplicate and edit now. <coughs> So let us allow Godot to duplicate the entire project and load. So this was the last scene of our code. And if we open here, you might see that a lot of these scripts are not even here. So if I open my main units, we have even the selection mesh. So which I also have erased. <coughs> so this is the basically difference from the code. So let me open here this was the code of the units itself so back before we have constants for the move speed for the select var for a path the current path index the move to path and the references to the objects it uses and the code that allows it to move is also here now on the new the newest version of the project we no longer have all of those if i go back here to the script of the units we only have this much simpler API here that just delegates that information back to the scripts. And as you can see how simple that looks. And I have also isolated the debug ABB function here. So yeah, let's see how we're going to do this. So hopefully you like this video and I'll see you on the next one. So thank you guys for watching.